Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. We have today Rick Sasari. This is part two. We had so much that we covered. There's so much more to cover. And Rick is back, so I'm really appreciative. He's gracious to join us again. You know, who's he's one of the legends and pioneers of direct response marketing with his many successful infomercials. He's helped sell more than $2 billion worth of product and launched over 30 brands, including Sonicare, OxyClean, George Foreman Grill, Juice Man, GoPro Camera, and many more. He's the author of Buy Now. And as I describe it, like I said, he turns helps turn great products into $100 million companies and household names. Rick, thanks for coming back. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you again. So Rick, you know, I asked this, you know, it's Inspired Insider, and I always ask, what's been the lowest moment? And then how you push through those tough times? Um, I've had a, a, a couple um, when in the late, 80s before I moved out to Seattle I uh, when I got to my start with that real estate guy I got into a legal battle with him and I had didn't have much resources and I had to declare bankruptcy oh, and um, I, I when I moved to Seattle I was um, I basically came out here with two suitcases I had borrowed money against from my mom to help fight some of these legal battles I was fifty thousand dollars in debt and came out to Seattle and like wasn't didn't have a job wasn't working a profession and kind of just started from scratch and that that was a a a, a pretty low low time um that sounds really painful yeah yeah it, it, it was and um um you know it was just you know you're you're actually in a position where um at that point fa- you know failure is not an option and you just have to do whatever you need to do to start um you know making life better. And, um, so that, that was, that was one, one point. And then I, uh, I, another point for me, what was, was your mindset at the time when you go back to that time? Cause you say you just have to do it, but that's sometimes easier said than done. What was your mindset that allowed well, you to do that? Yeah. We talked in the first part of the interview that I was really big in reading, um, motivational books and success books. Yeah. And I've always been a very optimistic person and mm-hmm. the glass is half full, not half empty. And even then I just knew that I, I could be successful. And, and I think there's a turn, you know, you can hit a point where you can, you can give up. Okay. And, um, you know, let life take its course. I, for me, I just stayed, I, you know, for me, I just would read about other people's success. I would read motivational books mm-hmm. And and positive thinking, I guess, is is and you hear a lot about that, but just really that type of optimistic outlook, positive thinking. Um, you know, I've since learned that a lot of times things are cycl- cyclical. You know, there's going to be ups and downs. I think I'm. Uh, you know, one of the favorite sayings I had from a mentor. You know, things are never as good as they seem, and things are never as bad as they seem. And um, you know, I just knew that. Um, I had an inner belief that things would get better and yeah. that I could help make them get, get better. Yeah. So, And you were about to mention there was another one. Another yeah, another, another one was more, um, I've always um, you know, been involved in health. I've always eaten healthy. And, um, but you know, my, my dad passed away when he was relatively young, 45 years old, but he had a bad lifestyle. He smoked two packs of camels a day, yeah. ate a lot of red meat, had lots of stress. Um, and, and he had to, you know, like a lot of people at that time died of cardiac, uh, heart attack, cardiac. Yeah, sorry to hear that. I'm yeah. Really careful about my health and, um, you know, would always go get my cholesterol checked, ate really healthy. I, I for a, a long period, I was a vegetarian for, for a long period. I'm not right now, but you know, just was really, really focused on health. So one day I, I would always get a yearly screening uh, and I went and got this, um, plaque screening where you're fully clothed, you lay on a table and they do, you know, they run something over you. And um, I remember I was eating dinner and I get a call and it was a doctor that had kind of worked with this thing. And he goes, well, I need to talk to you. There, there's something we found that um, is unusual. We need to do some more tests. So I came back in. It turned out I had an um, aneurysm on my Whoa. ascending aorta. Holy cow. That was 5.5 millimeters in diameter. You know, like if you picture a garden hose and it's the big bubble. Yeah. And they call it the um, I don't know the 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 silent killer. If that bursts, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so the 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 protocol at the time was 
at, at, mine was at 5.5 and and it was like okay the, the the way you fix this is open heart surgery which has risks in itself sure, so they would sure. monitor it and say okay if it looks like it's growing rapidly we have to operate right away right. and if it gets to a certain size and you know there's you know 5.8 or 5 whatever we you know we should operate because there's a risk of it you know um carrying ballooning open, out yeah yeah ballooning out and so we i actually monitored it for a year but i was really frustrated because I, here i am i lead a really healthy lifestyle yeah. everything's going good and the doctor was saying you know this could be genetic there's lots of reasons that cause it so i had to this was like uh 3 years ago i had to go in and um have open heart surgery where they you know the the main you know they wow. the big thing pull your chest open oh. and and so it it you know they fixed the problem it turned out they fixed that and then um put a new heart valve in uh, really? Yeah. Oh, I've, all this stuff, and it, and it turned out that might might have been the cause of it was they said I was born with a bicuspid valve, uh, and in and, and, and so that might have helped cause it. There was and a so, genetic but, thing going. Yeah. On. The amazing thing was, um, you know, when the surgery was done, the recovery period again, it was a low thing. Whenever you're, you know, if you're an active person and you're that you you you're out of it for like six weeks. I mean, it's and the hard time. part. Is when, you know the chest part is healing because they, they they crack open your ribs and that's the painful part the internal part all the work they do on your heart that's good from day you know from immediately and that's you know there's a little bit of healing but there's no pain involved in that so you're kind of bedridden and yeah they it, saw it, you i mean they saw you open exactly. they they basically take your your chest cavity and your oh. ribs and go like this and that's what yeah. they do is they, they and then they sew that all back together and it's kind of painful um yes. but that, that was kind of another low point just because um, but really, it makes you look at life too, and it's like you know, life is is short, and yeah. you know, go do the things you want to do yeah. because you never you never know. Um, it's it's you know, recognize that life is short and it could be taken away at any time. Yeah. You know. So what did you change after that? Realizing that I mean, you just um, had your chest cavity cracked open, and you know. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. I I did kind of change work a little bit, um, kind of made the company a little smaller, just, just wanted to basically freed up some more time. Cause I, I really enjoy, you can tell I enjoy what I do. I lo love doing this, but it, it, I was working a lot, but that's not, not the, what caused me to get sick. I mean, right. I don't, I don't think there was a connection there, but, um, but I did realize that I didn't, you know, need to slow down a little bit and just really smaller, little smaller company just um more more time to do some of the things mm -hmm. you know hobbies and different things i like mm -hmm. to like to do i like to travel and things like yeah. that so um that's the that's the yeah. biggest yeah well biggest thank change. god first of all you lived healthy because it probably would have been worse and second oh, yeah. that you had the testing done that they found it before it, oh, yeah. it burst so what's been the proudest moment um I guess the, the proudest moment, I mean, there's, I, you know, there's a personal side and yeah. the business side, you know, the uh, personal side is really just watching uh, my daughter, Anna, grow up and, and she graduated from University of Washington last year and she's over in Uganda right now uh, doing? doing some uh, uh, service work, building schools and houses and wow. things like that and helping with the malaria program. And I think that's kind of what she wants to do for a living is do kind of uh, relief work and mission work like that type of thing and and so it's been great um uh watching her grow up and and on the business side it's like um and then before on the personal you've climbed some major mountains oh that yeah that was kind of just a hobby and i uh, again i got into it because remember the i well i was doing it um the, if you live in seattle it's an outdoor culture and you know REI stores here and you wake up every morning and you see Mount Rainier and some people it's like they could care less for me. I, I when I first moved to Seattle, I would look out the window and I'd see that someday I'm going to climb that, you know, just because right. it's there, you know what I mean? I, you know, and, um, and it took me a few years to get around to doing it, but then I did and I kind of got bit by, um, a climbing bug and wanted to do it more and more. And that became a hobby. And my goal was actually, and this was before I had the open heart surgery. And so I, I had this, I didn't know I had this condition. Um, and I think it affected obviously my health somewhat with a leaky valve like that. And I didn't know it at the time, but, um, I, my goal was to, there was something where if you were into mountain climbing, you could do what they call the seven summits and it's the highest mountain on each continent. Oh, wow. And that, that would include Mount Everest. And wow. so I started to do that. And, um, uh, um, I, went over to Russia and climbed Mount Elbrus, which is the highest 
uh, mountain on a European continent. And um, I had a trip to Kilimanjaro. I was going to do that would be the highest mountain on in the African continent. And then the the one that was and I, I'd climbed a lot of other smaller mountains in the northwest and the Grand Tetons and the highest mountains in Mexico, which get up to 19,000 feet, Volca- all, most of them volcanoes. And then um, I, you know, for me, the, the big one that I climbed was Mount McKinley in Alaska. And that was a really fu- uh, interesting, it was a three week, like an expedition. Sounds and you dangerous. To get, yeah, to get prepared for something like Mount Everest yeah. or whatever. And, um, and then coming down from them is that's when I kind of found out I had the health issue. Not there was no, it didn't bother me on the mountain. I made it to the top, but um, once I the thing happened with my heart, it kind of derailed the mountain climbing thing. But that was kind of a, a hobby that I did for probably about five or six years. Wow. Um, and I actually I did um, the, when we climbed Mount Rainier for the first time, we did it with Joel Apple from the OxyClean oh, wow. type type thing yeah so that was uh because he was in who's from colorado and he was into hiking and climbing and wanted to do it so that was a fun thing so yeah. on the professional side what's been proud moment you know i i um to me just if you look at all the ones i've done and everything else yeah. i still have the best memories of the juice man business because um I feel like it not only was an area that I was interested in, we built a successful business, but I really felt like we really helped change the way people look at their diet, uh, a lot of people. I mean, back then, we weren't the original juicing people, but it did start a you. I mean, if you look around at juicing Huge now, movement, yeah. it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it's like, you know, it's more bottled juices, you know, fresh, fresh cold pressed juices, but it's everywhere. And I think that one for me was my favorite because it was the first really big success, but I also was, um, it was my product. It was the owner, you know, the owner of the company. I wasn't doing it for someone else. And it was a category that I just loved and continue to love. I mean, yeah. anything that has to do with health and nutrition, I'm, I'm always interested in. So that, that yeah. was to me the, my, you know, the one I'm my favorite, I would say. Yeah. Rick, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, tell people, where they should go to check you out. What are you okay. working on lately? Yeah, so anyway, um, really interesting thing we're working on now, but um, I'll tell you in a second, but you can go to our website, which is uh, cesaridirect.com, yeah. C-E-S-A-R-I direct.com. Yeah. And uh, there's a way of getting in contact with us right on the, on the website. You can see some of the projects we talked about. Yeah. But also, um, so we're working some for some fun projects. So anyway, we... Um, are d- just finished an infomercial with um, Dr. Phil's wife, Robin McGraw. It's a skincare line. But their son, Jay, uh, Jay McGraw, he's the executive producer for the show called The Doctors sure. that you see on TV. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we, he, he's interested. He read my book, and he's interested in direct marketing. He's a really entrepreneurial guy. And they're coming out with, and we're working on ads and running them right now, uh, a startup company called Doctor on Demand, hmm. and it's an app that you can download on your phone, and you don't have to have insurance. And um, there's different um, offers, but the basic is for forty dollars, anyone could call up and talk to a doctor, an, an MD, for um, fifteen minutes, and they have the ability to prescribe over the phone certain medications like antibiotics, mm-hmm. you know, different ones. And there's different categories. And what I want to do, my my thing is I want to, that's going to be very successful. There was just a, a headline out that uh, Richard Branson invested in the company. And it's going to be huge because it's kind of the future of where yeah, I think it's going to go. Made very accessible it's healthcare. Exciting. Yeah. What I want to bring to the table yeah. is the natural part of that Uh, uh naturopathic doctors and chiropractic doctors to be able to give people that option of being able to call up and and do that type of medicine in addition to the to the regular doctor so it's one where the it's exciting because the technology is now available healthcare is changing i think it's going to be a a wave of the future and it's it's going it's a fun one to again another one fun one to to, to, to work on it that helps people and benefits people. Yeah. And people definitely need to check out the book, uh, buy now also yeah, like I listen, like I said, three to six books per week. And I told someone 
like when I first read or listened to it, this I've listened to it three times already, and uh, it's definitely one of my favorites of all time. And oh, that's great. Thank yeah, you for. I'm not just saying that because oh, you're in front of me. I, What's that? You told me when we first talked that you had three or four or a couple ideas for new books. I have some titles written down of your future books. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll have to share those with you. Okay. I would love. I would love to. Because I to took notes as I'm, you know, I list try and listen at the computer so I can take notes uh, on right. it. And uh, yeah, I definitely have a lot of notes and a lot of ideas for a lot of future future books. If that's what the route you want to go. Um, so my last question, Rick, is what's some of the craziest things that have come across your desk? You probably get so many ideas and people oh, pitching yeah. you. Some of the crazy things and maybe some of the things you passed on that you wish, well, wish you would You know, have. part of the fun part of this, fun slash frustrating part of this business is dealing with inventors. Because inventors right. are unique people. And I don't know if you've had that experience. They, they, um, they always think that they have the next GoPro. And no matter what the product is, and and um, and they're you know very uh, a lot of times very protective. They think it's like the next big seller. I mean, huge huge you know success. And some of them are really weird things. So two of them that I re that I remember, and like you said, I, I get a lot of them. But um, somebody, and it's always a red flag to me when someone calls or emails and they're very secretive and I got this great product and, you know, I, 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 I want to share it with you, but I don't want you to steal the idea. And I go, I don't steal ideas, you know, and, and then, you know, we can sign a non-disclosure. So we went through this whole process with this guy. And basically, he sent us, uh, I go, can you set, we signed a non-disclosure. Can you send us a prototype? He wouldn't tell us what it was. And I, I get, open up a box and there's a hanger with two um, uh, clothespins on it. And I go, what, what's this thing? And he goes, well, it's a new way for um, doctors to look at x-rays. And he goes, I, I'm an x-ray technician. And I think this will, I mean, it's really, I mean, believe it, that's really silly. I mean, I just, like some of the stuff you get. Then, then there was one where, um, I forget the name of it, but again, it was an inventor. And it was a device that automatically raised and lowered the toilet seat which obviously is a common problem and you think it would sell really well but it was it functionally it didn't really work but it was again it was just a, a weird thing and those are kind of like to me like that would be like a gimmick product that i don't can't really get behind but it was mm -hmm. just amusing then then one of the funniest was um uh these two guys called our office and they um were talking to us and um they had a product, and again, they were wanted to tell us about it. And it turned out they were hunters, and they were calling from Minnesota. And um, they had a product called, uh, you know, what's the name of it? And it's, it's called Seasoned Shot. And I go, what's what's that? So they go, well, what we've done is we've taken shotgun shells, and instead of pellets, we've put in, in like um, uh, spices. And so when you actually shoot the the bird, they're already spiced up. And they, this is a real product. And and uh, that was one of the fun. I mean, and they were a hundred percent. Sometimes, like you just laugh. Sometimes it's like you just want to laugh at some of the stuff you hear. But they, they, you know, <laughs> it, it's just seasoned shot. And I think they actually it's got a good name. Actually, yeah, you can actually find it at some hunting stores now. But they, you know, can we make a commercial for this? People will buy it. And I go, I don't think I'm interested in in doing that. But that that's a pretty pretty funny one. Uh, Any yeah. that you wish that anyone that you passed on that you wish you wouldn't have. Yeah, um, let me think about. I, there, there have been um, def, definitely. I'm just, I'm just drawing a blank right now. Like I, yesterday, I, I like to think about them probably because it was like, oh, it was a good opportunity. Right. Not so much from making a money standpoint, but just you know, a fun product to 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 market. I'm gonna have to get back to you on like, that one. Like I, interesting. Like I talked to uh, yesterday. I interviewed Nolan Bushnell, founder yeah. of Atari. Oh, yeah. And we were talking about he got offered a third of Apple for fifty oh, yeah, for fifty thousand dollars and yeah. passed it up. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. That. Uh, uh, so and I've had oppor you know oppor opportunity. Yeah. That that's one. That's the probably. I'm sure the there's thing. some like that for you somewhere. I don't know if it was in Steve Jobs' book or I remember reading that. Story. Walter Isaacson, maybe maybe the biography. Oh, yeah. Exactly. But he confirmed it. It's true. Yeah. He said. He passed it up. You know? That must have been fascinating to talk to talk to. I mean, some of the people you talk to, it's it's just it's great. It must be really really fascinating for you. It is. It's amazing. As I figured, there's got. Do you see be... any common threads? 
common threads? Do you see any? Yeah, I mean, like, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people and things like that, again, it, it has to be in a certain subject. But you interview a lot of successful people. Um, any commonality or things you see, and or is it just a lot of differences? And, uh, you know, I, you know, that's a good question. The some of the commonalities I see are kind of what you say, that positive outlook and that perseverance. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. no matter what, they'll just, they're so confident. And yes. that's why that's why I always ask the question, how do you know whether to kill an idea or keep going with it? Because a lot of the successful people, they're just pushing through, like you said, you go yeah. bankrupt, you, you know, you don't hear about yeah, well, those it's, challenges. It's the old Will Rogers saying, you know, um, if you're in a hole, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. You, you know what I mean? But then you balance that with, okay, you know, never give up. And 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 I think that you can have, and and a lot of times you read about um, entrepreneurial people or hear about them that have spectacular failures, and you know they won't give up until absolutely everything explodes. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes people are fortunate that that doesn't happen but a lot of entrepreneurs have that in their background like i told you about nick woodman and you know his first internet company just blowing mm -hmm. up and he lost like four million dollars of investor money and um it, you know everyone i think a lot of successful entrepreneurs have that in their background that they really don't give up and the market forces them you know to 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 stop but but then they don't give up they go okay what's the next idea right and that is it's almost uh, relieving in a way yeah because exactly. and that's why i like to ask about those challenges and those mistakes because we only hear about the big successes we oh, don't yeah, hear absolutely. about the things that didn't go well or we don't hear about you know i went bankrupt i had two suitcases and i had to borrow money from my mom that that's actually motivating you know yeah. people like i was yeah. here and i just persevered and built it back up to to what it is now yeah it's it's yeah it's very you know the more you you talk to people you probably see this too um there's very few like overnight successes. People usually pay their dues. Yes. And then something becomes a big success, but it mm -hmm. isn't just right out of the the can like that. Yes. And yeah. that is what we he, we what that's what the media I think portrays a lot of times is it just yeah, overnight success, but Billy Mays was doing all of those shows those, and in just Jake practicing Cordage, his same pitch. thing those yeah. guys spent years and years and years yeah. on fair circuit you know pitching and like i said in health food stores paid their dues and then then when the time was right they yeah. capitalized on it that's so. what i love to hear that's this your yeah. stories you know that's what i love to hear and that's what people i think um you know love to listen to so rick i really appreciate it you know thank you so much again for for part two yeah, it's been fun. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing back the interview. The the interview, so yeah, it'll be great. Thank you, Thank Rick. You. Good experience. Fantastic. Right, bye now.